All right, we will begin uh, chapter 13, uh, the endocrine system. All right, the endocrine system is involved with the major communications uh, within the body, in addition to the nervous system. Its biggest function is to keep the body at a homeostasis, a stable internal environment. Now, this is done through uh, reactions of substances called hormones. All right, here's the official definition of a hormone. These are chemical messengers that are secreted into the blood by an endocrine gland. Now, a lot of people will confuse endocrine and exocrine. They mean two very different things. An endocrine gland will secrete substances into the internal environment, such as into the blood. So endo means inside, so endocrine goes into the internal environment. Uh, the opposite of that is the exocrine gland. These will secrete substances into the external environment through a duct. So think of uh, when you sweat. You go sweat goes outside of your body through a sweat gland. That's an exocrine uh, secretion. Uh, oh, when, you lacti when you're lactating, milk comes out of the mammary glands. That's an exocrine secretion. So endocrine goes in the internal environment, like the blood. Exocrine through the external environment through a duct. In this chapter, we'll talk about endocrine uh, features. All right, there are various types of endocrine uh, glands, and they're all classified by where their target cells are, where the hormones will actually act. Uh, the first one we have here, paracrine. These are also known as the local hormones. Uh, these uh, secretions will act on the cells that neighbor the gland itself. So just around two or three cells right around where it's being secreted from. So those are paracrine secretions. Uh, autocrine secretions. These affect only the secreting cell itself. So auto automatically only affects that one cell itself. All right, here's a illustration of uh, the body with some of the major endocrine uh, structures we'll talk about here today. Uh, hypothalamus here in the brain, uh, just below that pineal gland, uh, pituitary gland, we'll talk about this quite a bit uh, in this lecture. Uh, the parathyroids and the thyroid glands, uh, the thymus, right in front of the trachea there, uh, liver, the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys, uh, the kidneys, the pancreas, which is behind the stomach. Uh, for the females, the ovaries, uh, the placenta during uh, pregnancy, which we'll talk about at the end of the course, and male, the testes. All right, we'll spend most of this chapter talking a lot about, a lot about the pituitary gland. And it's often called the master gland because it deals with so many hormones in one portion of the gland in particular. Now, even though it is called the master gland and has such a major vital role in the endocrine system, it itself is controlled by another structure of the brain called the hypothalamus. So yes, pituitary gland is important, but it is controlled by the hypothalamus. Now the pituitary is attached to the uh, hypothalamus by a structure called the infundibulum, a little stalk-like feature, which I'll show you here next. All right, here's the hypothalamus here. Uh, or here's what we're looking at, this area here, close up. Hypothalamus is part of the brain. Uh, the infundibulum is a stalk-like feature here. Then you have the two different portions of the pituitary gland, the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe, which we'll talk about here in a second. All right, the generic name, uh, generic formal name for the pituitary is the hypophysis. It has two very distinct and different regions, like I mentioned before, the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Now the formal name for the anterior lobe is the adenohypophysis. So A for anterior, A for adenohypophysis. And the posterior lobe is also known as the neurohypophysis. And these lobes are different in different, many ways. Uh, for one, the anterior lobe is made up of vascular tissue. And the posterior lobe is made up of neural tissue or nerves. And in actuality, the posterior lobe is really just an extension of the hypothalamus itself. So anterior lobe, vascular. Uh, posterior lobe is uh, nervous tissue or neural tissue. Uh, the anterior lobe will secrete many hormones. We'll talk about those in a few slides. Uh, the uh, posterior lobe does not secrete hormones. The lobes or the hormones that come from the posterior lobe are actually made in the hypothalamus, but they're just stored in the posterior lobe until they're needed. But the anterior lobe actually secretes hormones. Posterior lobe does not. Or anterior lobe synthesizes hormones, posterior lobe does not synthesize hormones. Alright, here's a 
a slide of the pituitary if you were to cut a cross section, which we'll do in lab, a DNA hypothesis, anterior lobe here, and a posterior lobe. And they look very different when stained. This is vascular tissue, so it will stain a little bit darker. And then the posterior lobe is uh, nervous tissue, so it stains a little bit lighter. But anterior lobe is always going to be darker. Alright, this next uh, segment we'll talk about the hormones of the anterior pituitary. And you'll see that I have the, the formal name of the hormone and its abbreviation, if it has any, right behind it. It's perfectly fine to address them as their abbreviation or their full name. It doesn't really matter which, because both are correct. Uh, the first one, growth hormone, or GH. As the name kind of implies, it will stimulate cells to get larger and divide more rapidly. It's what will promote uh, the growth of long bones. This is how you get taller. So growth hormone deals with growing, so the name kind of tells you what it is. Uh, prolactin, or PRL, this will help promote milk production when a woman is pregnant. When you're lactating, you are making milk, so prolactin helps promote milk production. Uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, this will help control the secretions of the thyroid gland. And again, the name tells you what it's doing. The thyroid stimulating hormone, stimulating the hormones of the thyroid gland. Uh, the next one, adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. This will control the uh, hormones of the adrenal cortex. And the cortex is a region of the adrenal gland. So adrenocorticotropic, or ACTH, will control those hormones coming just from that portion of the adrenal gland. Uh, FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, will control the growth of follicles in the ovaries of the female. Uh, also will stimulate secretion of the estrogen in females and also stimulates uh, production of sperm cells in males. So that's FSH. And the last one on here, LH, luteinizing hormone. This is what will help release the egg in females during ovulation. So these six, I'll go back here, GH, PRL, TSH, ACTH, FSH, LH, all those six are from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So when this comes up on a test, and it will, if you just list pituitary gland, it's going to be marked wrong. You must put anterior pituitary gland. All right, for the posterior lobe of the pituitary, there's only two hormones. Uh, the first one, antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. These will cause the kidneys to reduce your information. These will help you pee less. A diuretic it will help you pee more. So when you want to conserve that water and pee less, you take antidiuretics, or antidiuretics. And last one, OT, oxytocin. This will help, help uh, stimulate uh, the uterine muscles during contractions for childbirth. If you've had a, a pregnancy that was induced, you're most likely given a synthetic form of this called tocin. So that's what oxytocin does. It helps stimulate the contractions of the uterus to help push out the baby. And that's something that we'll talk about more at the end of the course also. So these are the only two hormones that come from the posterior pituitary gland. Again, if these come up on a test, if you just put pituitary, it's going to be marked wrong. You must put posterior pituitary for both of these. All right, we'll move on to the next gland, the thyroid gland. It's found just below uh, the voice box, the larynx, and just in front of the trachea. It consists of two lobes that form uh, a butterfly shape, and they're connected uh, by a thin band of tissue called the isthmus. And the thyroid itself is made up of sections called follicles. And these follicles are filled with a, a clear kind of viscous fluid called a colloid. And the cells that are outside of these follicles have multiple names. And something that you probably have picked up in anatomy by now, it's very common to have certain structures or processes have more than one name. Uh, and I have them listed here. I would like you to know them as the extra follicular cells because they are beyond the follicle cells. They're extra follicular cells. They're also known as the C cells or the parafollicular cells. Any of these three terms is correct, but the one bold is what I would like you to know. Extra follicular. All right, here's an illustration of a person. Here's the uh, thyroid cartilage up here and the thyroid gland right here. So that looks from the front view and from the back view. We'll talk about these four nodules here in a second. The parathyroids. And then the isthmus is right here. So it looks kind of like a butterfly shape. So that's one lobe, that's one lobe, connected by the isthmus.
is one uh, a real slide if you were to take it and cut it cross section. This whole structure here is one follicle. So that's one follicle, that's one follicle, that's one follicle. And this clear fluid here in the middle, which keeps it that open oval shape, that's the colloid. So there's colloid in here, colloid in here, here, and so on. Alright, same thing again. The follicles here, follicles here, and the cells that are outside of these follicles right here are the extra follicular cells or the C cells right here. Because they're not in the follicle itself, they're just outside of the follicles. Alright, the hormones of the thyroid gland. These have kind of cumbersome names, but they have some very short abbreviations. I'll address them as both, but it's much more much easier to call them uh, T4 and T3. Uh, the first one, thyroxin. The formal name, tetraiodothyramine, or T4. Where tetra means four. So perfectly fine to call thyroxin T4. This will help uh, regulate metabolism, uh, accelerate growth and development, and helps control the metabolic rate and appetite. Uh, the second one, triiodothyronine, or T3. Exactly the same functions as T4, but T3 is much, much stronger. About ten times as strong. So both T4 and T3 have the same functions, but T3 a lot, lot stronger. And both of these are secreted by the follicles of the thyroid gland. Uh, calcitonin. This will help to regulate the levels of calcium in the blood. Now these are secreted by the extra follicular cells that we just talked about. When the calcium levels are too high, its overall effect is to lower the levels of calcium. And this is in bold for a reason. This is very easily confused with another hormone that I'll talk about in a second. So calcitonin, its effect is to lower blood calcium. Okay. Moving on to the parathyroid gland, those four nodules on the back of the thyroid, on the posterior side, uh, they produce what should be the easiest hormone to remember, parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Parathyroid hormone comes from the parathyroid gland. I shouldn't get confused, but people still do for some reason. Now, the PTH is secreted when calcium levels are too low. So its overall effect is to raise blood calcium. So calcitonin and PTH have exactly opposite effects. Calcitonin will lower blood calcium. PTH, our parathyroid hormone, will raise blood calcium. As a little image that helps kind of put this uh, all together, this is where you want blood calcium to be. Very stable very level uh, uh, setting. When it gets too high, the parathyroid uh, gland will kick in, secrete calcitonin to lower it back to normal. So calcitonin lowers blood calcium. If the opposite happens, if the calcium level gets too low, the parathyroids here, those four yellow dots, will secrete parathyroid hormone and it will increase blood calcium. So you always want to be at a nice, steady, stable level. So calcitonin lowers blood calcium, PTH raises blood calcium. Here's how uh, the parathyroid hormone or parathyroid gland looks in cross section. No real discernible pattern to it. This is kind of a, a jumbled mess. And we won't talk about the oxbill cells or the chief cells, so don't worry about those. All right, we'll move on to the adrenal glands. These are uh, pyramid-shaped glands that look like a little hat to sit on top of the kidneys. And they have two very distinct regions, the medulla and the cortex. And each region will secrete uh, different types of hormones. Now these terms here, medulla and cortex, are very generic, very common terms in biology, in anatomy. Cortex always means the outside or outermost portion of a structure. Medulla always means toward the middle. So M for medulla, M for middle. Cortex means outside. All right, here's an illustration of, of these. Here are the kidneys here. And the little hats that sit on top are the adrenals. This light blue is the cortex. And the light pink in the middle is the medulla. All right, we'll talk about the hormones of the adrenal medulla first. And again, this is very similar to the pituitary gland. The hormones that come from the medulla are different from the ones of the cortex. So if it comes up on a test, and it will come up on a test, if all you put is the adrenal gland, it's going to get marked wrong. You need to put what exactly, what region. Is it the medulla or is it the cortex? If you don't put it, it's going to get marked wrong. Because I need to know that you know where it's coming from. 
All right, the cells in medulla are called uh, chromaffin cells, and they secrete two very closely related hormones, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Most people know epinephrine as adrenaline or norepinephrine as noradrenaline. This is why people who have uh, very severe allergies will carry an EpiPen. Epi means epinephrine. That's why you carry adrenaline with you. Now, although these are very similar sounding and very similar in function, they are not identical. They have some uh, functions that are exactly opposite of each other. So they're very closely related, but they are not identical. And some of these features that are similar, you know, increased heart rate, you know, increased breathing rate, uh, a lowering of digestive activity, and so on. So whenever you have a rush of adrenaline, your heart's going to beat faster, you're going to breathe heavier, you know, your pupils will, uh, will dilate so you can get more uh, visual acuity. So all these are functions of both epinephrine and norepinephrine. All right, this is a, a chemical uh, demonstration or example of how these compounds look. And now we're not asked these on a test. It's just for information. Both of these, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, are based on the amino acid dopamine. The only difference between this compound and norepinephrine is the addition of this hydroxide group right there. The only difference between norepinephrine and epinephrine is adding this methyl group here. So they are very closely related, but again, they are not identical. All right, we'll move on to the hormones of the adrenal cortex. Now, some of these hormones are critical for life. And two of the most important ones are aldosterol and cortisol. I'm sorry, aldosterone and cortisol, excuse me. Uh, aldosterone will help to regulate the concentrations of electrolytes by conserving sodium ions and getting rid of potassium ions. And both of these will help control blood pressure. And the kidney hormone renin will stimulate the release of the aldosterone. Uh, cortisol, this will influence glucose and proteins and fats by these three steps. And the whole point of all three of these is to raise uh, blood glucose so you have more energy. Cortisol is also known as the stress hormone. So it's okay to have this produced for a little while, but you don't want this produced all the time. Uh, first way it impacts proteins, it will stop proteins from being made, so the amino acids can be uh, loose and individualized. Those amino acids can be put back together to form sugar. So you want to stop making proteins, so you can have these kind of loosely around, so other structures can make uh, energy and glucose from those. It also will release, or release the fatty acids from the uh, fat tissue, the adipose tissue. So this will decrease the need to use glucose as an energy source. It will use the fatty acids as an energy source. And uh, number three, it will stimulate the liver to synthesize glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. This also will increase blood glucose levels. So all three of these, even if it's kind of wordy, the whole point is to get more energy available right away. So we stop proteins from being made, because these can be combined together here to make sugars. Uh, you can get glucose from fatty acids and also from non-carbohydrate sources also to make more glucose. Here's how the adrenal glands look in cross-section. The cortex here looks a little bit differently than the portion in the middle of the medulla. And don't worry about these particular zones. You know, it gets a lot more detail than this. But just know that cortex, the outside medulla is in the middle. And be able to keep track of what hormones come from what region. All right, uh, the pancreas. This has a dual function. It has an endocrine function and exocrine function. We'll talk about the exocrine function when we get to the uh, digestive system. Uh, but for now, we'll talk about the endocrine uh, functions. Uh, these endocrine sections of this organ are grouped in cells uh, called pancreatic islets. The formal name is the islets of Langerhans. And these islets have three different types of cells that are that will secrete something. You have alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. All three secrete something different. All right, here's an illustration of where this is. Of course, you have the liver here, gallbladder underneath that, and just behind the stomach, which is kind of grayed out here, is the pancreas. Right there. This is how an islet of Langerhans looks. It will stain a little bit lighter than the area around it. So this lighter colored portion is one islet and the pancreas will be filled with them.
and it's within here that you'll get the alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Uh, talk about the hormones of the pancreas and what cells produce those. Uh, the first one, glucagon. This will stimulate the liver to break down the stored form of glucose, which is called glycogen, back into glucose. So its effect will raise blood sugar. Uh, this is secreted by the alpha cells. Okay, so glucagon will raise blood sugar. The one that people are probably most familiar with, insulin. Of course, this has the opposite effect of glucagon. This will lower blood sugar. And these are secreted by the beta cells. So glucagon from alpha, insulin from the beta cells. And these two have, as you can tell, opposite effects. Glucagon will raise blood sugar, insulin needs to lower blood sugar. So the third one will help to kind of control both of these, so one doesn't get too out of hand. And it's called somatostatin. This will help regulate the secretions of both glucagon and insulin. These are secreted by the delta cells. All right, lastly, we'll cover uh, this generically some other endocrine glands. Uh, the pineal gland, this is found in the th near the thalamus of the brain. This will secrete uh, melatonin, which is what makes you sleepy whenever it gets uh, cloudy or dark out. So there's a real physiological reason why you get tired when it's overcast out, because melatonin is being secreted in higher amounts. So the pineal gland will make that hormone, melatonin. Uh, the thymus, the organ will create or synthesize hormones called thymosins. So thymus, thymosins, the name tells you where it comes from. And this is something that we'll talk about in a couple chapters. This has a major role with immunity of your body. Now the thymus will start out fairly large, relatively speaking, when you're a child. But as soon as you hit puberty, you'll start to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time you get to middle age, it's basically all gone. And of course, lastly, uh, testes will produce testosterone for males. And ovaries will produce estrogen and progesterone in females. Okay, this should be the last one. Okay. All right, that concludes Chapter uh, 13, the endocrine system. I know we covered a lot, so if you have questions, definitely call or text or email me or post the questions on the discussion board under Blackboard.